Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now, podcasting from the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center in Chicagoland, here are your hosts, Ed Stetzer and Daniel Yang. Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name's Daniel Yang, the director of the Sen Institute, and we're excited to have with us today, Carrie Newoff. Carrie's a leadership author, speaker, podcaster, and former attorney. He's also the founding pastor of Connexus Church in Barrie, Ontario, and he now hosts one of today's most influential leadership podcasts. His leadership content is accessed over a million times per month by leaders, and his most recent book is At Your Best, How to Get Time, Energy, and Priorities Working in Your Favor. But before we hear from Kerry, let's go to our host, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and the Executive Director of Wheaton College Billy Graham Center at Stetzer. Well, thank you so much. And you guys have something in common. That's right. The canadian this. You both yeah. have pastored in Canada. We did. Though you I, were not Canadian. I'm not Canadian, but Canadian. I've spent time. I've even visited uh, Connexus and one of the best guest services that I experienced. Nice, nice. Yeah. Okay, oh, really? Okay. I'm like, well, that's good to go. know. Now he wants, to, he wants to know more. Tell us more about this. Was that when he was pastor? He was. Yeah. Kerry, you were still pastoring. Uh, I was getting ready to plant in downtown Toronto. So right. came up to Connexus with my family and just the warmth and the attention that we received as newcomers. It was great. Nice. Oh, that nice. is so good to know. You just never know who's going to show up, right? On yeah, Sunday. you never know the riffraff that might come in a yeah, church in Toronto. Riffraff. And so, uh, and now, you know, my daughter's near where your church is. We're all it's right. Canadian moments. It's, We're having it's, Canadian everywhere. Cool, okay. So, cool. so uh, oh, Canada. So we were just, Gary Newoff, we were just in uh, Texas, which is very different than the current feel in Ontario or in True Illinois. Story. When it, and, and it was funny because I'm sitting, we're just having breakfast together and he's such a rock star. People are like coming up to him and saying, oh, you're so helpful with this leadership. And I love that about this. But one of the things that, I mean, I, when I think of Kerry Newhoff, I think he's out hustled and outworked most of us. I mean, I just think, and I know that that has to do, and in, in the book, he talks about this. The book is at your best, how to get the time, energy, and priorities working in your favor. You have described to me in the title, Kerry Newhoff, you have got your time, mm-hmm. energy, and priorities working in your favor. So so I found this super helpful in so many ways. And one of the premises of your book is that most of us are so stressed by our careers and our lives in general that we want to escape from them. Um, have you seen this with pastors? This is not a written towards pastors book, though it's going to be tur- tur- totally appropriate to pastors, but have you observed this to be true of pastors? Have you experienced this as a pastor yourself? Yeah, I definitely have seen it uh, anecdotally in pastors and went through that season myself. So I think when it comes to pastoral ministry, most of us feel an intense sense of calling. Hopefully, if you don't have that, you're not in ministry. But what I found uh, before my burnout was that the stress was becoming really, really difficult to handle. And as a result, I found myself having these like and and ask ask some of your colleagues this like do you have a fantasy career like if you weren't doing ministry today what would you do so i thought i wanted to stack boxes in a warehouse just go work at a warehouse and move boxes all day because unlike human beings when you try to get a box to do something and you move it it stays where you put it <laughs> um humans don't tend to do this I've thought about, well, maybe I could have a car detailing service. You know, you have a dirty car, then you have a clean car at the end of the day. It's so simple. And, you know, when I, when I talk to a lot of leaders, they, in ministry and out of ministry, they seem to have this escapist notion that I have so much pressure right now. I just want a job with no pressure. So that's what I kind of meant. And then sadly, you know, if you want to go to the dark side, uh, there are people I have had conversations with who had affairs that were ministry ending and sometimes family ending. And they said they were looking for an escape. It's yeah. just like the pressure was too much. This was a, a cheap and easy, but expensive way out. And so therefore I blew up my marriage. I blew up my ministry. And, uh, so, you know, that's the shadow side of it. And fortunately that wasn't part of our story for my wife and I, but, you know, that idea of, gosh, I really can't handle the pressure. I'd rather do something else that seems, quote, easier with my life. Yeah, I think that's a real thing. Yeah. So, and, and I, I think um, we have not seen yet what I would have maybe expected by now. It's good to tell people sometimes your expectations don't come true. I'm not a uh, great prognosticator of the future. But um, we kind of talked about you know, a significant number of pastors burning out and leaving the ministry. 
we've not seen that yet. Um, you guys do the uh, the Barna Church Pulse, I think is mm-hmm. if I got the right name. Yeah. And you guys talked about some of that data that significant number of pastors are thinking about leaving the ministry, but we don't know how that compares to where they were three years ago. Um, so, but I, I do think that I have a thesis that kind of like when pastors get through a church building project, they tend to leave after the church building project because they mm-hmm. got everyone across the finish line. I do think there are a lot of burned out and tired and discouraged pastors that early in 2022, we're going to start to see some of that resignation take place. What are some things, you know, our, audience, our audience is church leaders. What are some things uh, from the book that, and again, just to remind everyone, the book is is at your best. What are some things pastors can do now, church leaders can do now to be at their best, to be able to maintain some of the pace and some of the passion that they have in the midst of a really tumultuous and difficult time? I think it's finding a sustainable pace. The, the challenge with COVID is everybody I know, and I'm sure this is true of the two of you as well, everyone's worked harder than they've ever worked in their lives. And the challenge with that is it's just not sustainable. However, if you go back to 2017, 2018, 2019, people were already burned out. It's not like the pandemic ushered in burnout. It's not like, oh, what is this new thing? Burnout. We've never heard of it before. Burnout has been away around for decades, and it's been a casualty of ministry for a long time. And when I was really processing what was happening in the first year of the pandemic, as I was getting the final draft of my book in to the publisher, the penny dropped for me. And What hit me is I heard so many leaders talking about, well, I just have to get to Christmas. I just have to get summer vacation. I just have to get to a week at the beach. I just have to get to, and I think we often intuitively or instinctively use our time off to heal us and time off won't heal you when the problem is how you spend your time on. And for most of us, the problem isn't like, we know how to vacation at the beach. I've figured that out. We, we know how to be off on a weekend where we have the weekend off. Like we're pretty good at that. What we're not good at is Monday to Friday. What we're not good at is the other 50 weeks a year when we're at work. And it just, it just doesn't scale. So I would say the key is how do you find a sustainable pace? Now the excuses are over. The world is going to be turbulent for a while to come. I think unpredictability is going to be part of our future. So the question then becomes, how do you find a sustainable pace? Because if you quit your job, guess what? You bring you into your next assignment. And if you just naturally run at an unsustainable pace, you're going to have that problem if you leave ministry and start selling insurance. You're going to have that problem if you start detailing cars. Like you're just going to wear yourself out. So it's really to think about, okay, what are you doing during your workday to guarantee a much more sustainable pace? Carrie, I think you're getting at something that when I was pastoring, I, I fell into it and it was, it was kind of er- erroneous thinking. Like I just thought that I was going to always be stressed out. I was going to eventually burn out. Uh, talk about the errors in thinking, errors in planning that lead to perpetual stress, eventually burnout, and then, you know, maybe specifically around ministry. Well, I think you hinted at it. It's this idea that this 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 is par for the course. Like, this is how I have to, to do that. So I'll give you a parable from my one year in law. I worked in downtown Toronto where you planted a church. So I worked um, in law for a year. And I knew I was going into cemetery, cemetery, seminary. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> anyway, uh, I knew I was going to seminary and I was very honest with the firm. I said, Hey, I'm not going to practice law, but I will give you a really good year. And they were very gracious and they hired me. There were two students from my class, me and another guy who were hired by that firm, um, from my law school. So the the drill in downtown Toronto was you have to play by the downtown big city rules. Some of the firms, we, we were a smaller firm, but at the big firms, they brought in chefs so that you didn't have to go home to eat. They had cots. So, well, if it's just easier, just sleep at the firm overnight, right? And then you can get right back at it in the morning. We didn't have that, but we had a six or seven day a week, uh, 18 hour culture. And that was just expected. And I decided not to play the game. I was newly married. Uh, Halfway through uh, law, we welcomed our first child into, or halfway through the year, we welcomed our first child into the world. 
And I wanted to be a husband and a dad. And I also knew this is not my life. So what I did, I got in early in the morning. I would usually arrive at the office by 7 a.m. I had court most days, so I'd go do my courtroom work. And then I'd work through the afternoon. And about 4.30 or 5, when the legal assistants were leaving, I would sneak out with them and head down the elevators and go home. I didn't want anyone to see me because the lawyers were all there until, you know, the sun set and they were there on evenings and weekends, never worked an, a, a weekend. I think the only evenings I ever worked is if I was out of town in court and couldn't get back in time because of traffic. Fast forward to the end of the year, end of the year comes. And I thought, well, you know, I, I gave them a good year. One of the partners took me out for lunch. He said, Carrie, what do we need to do to convince you to stop? Uh, doing seminary and just come and work for us. I'm like, no, 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 that, that one's decided. I feel called from God. It was a longer conversation, but he stopped me halfway through and I'll never forget this. He said, Carrie, we're offering you a job. Here's your salary. It was more than two X what I would possibly ever make in ministry. He said, you're the only student in the history of the firm to make the firm money. You made us a hundred thousand dollars this year. I still said no. And I went into seminary. Anyway, very, very honored to be asked. My classmate, he did the whole downtown legal firm thing. He worked 18 hours a day, six, seven days a week. He was tired all the time. And you know what happened to him at the end of the year? They let him go. Oh, wow. Because he lost the firm money. So I did not play the rat race. And I got a, a, a promotion and a good salary offer. And somewhere along the lines in ministry, I forgot that lesson. Mm -hmm. And after a decade, I became the guy who was doing 18 hours a day, wow. six, seven days a week. And then God graciously allowed me to burn out without totally blowing up my life. And I learned my lesson again. And now I run at a very different pace. Yeah, tell us a little bit about the burnout story. Um, that's a key part of your whole journey and really about the leadership advice you give. I mean, you don't speak from this as something you avoided, you actually went through, you burned out, you, you, you blew, you blew up. I mean, like you said, it wasn't like, well, you tell the story. Tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. There was no scandal right, right, um, right. for the first time though. Ed, I'll be honest with you. It got so dark in my heart, never lost my faith, but I thought, Oh, this is what it must feel like when you end up going to bed with somebody you're not married to. Like this yeah. must be the state from which that um, happens, or that's when you do something really stupid, like quit your job. So by the grace of God, I didn't end up sleeping with anybody that I wasn't married to. I didn't quit my job. But what happened was as, as somebody who is an entrepreneurial driven person, I spent all of my thirties pedal to the metal, hard, 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 run, run, run. And our church was growing. And so I was validated by the external success. So externally, we're growing. Internally, I'm imploding. And I didn't realize that at the time because I thought I could just push through it. And people told me, particularly toward my late 30s, Carrie, you're going to burn out. And I'm like, no, I'm not. That's for weak people. And then one day, I woke up and it's like my body went on strike and said, we're breaking up with you. We're not doing this anymore. And the way it showed up in my life was just a total loss of energy. Lost my energy, lost my passion, lost my drive. And at first I thought, oh, I'll, you know, take a weekend off, go to bed earlier, didn't help. Took three weeks off in July. The burnout started in May. I took three weeks off in July. It made it worse, not better. And I'm like, mm. oh crap. And that was the thing about burnout. Being tired, usually there's some cause and effect. Usually it's like, oh, I went to bed now, I feel better the next day. When you burn out, you really surrender control. And so it was about four or five months until I felt the first flicker of passion wow. return again. And then it was a very slow return to what became a new normal. And then out of that, I started working on pace. I started working on how to manage my time. I started to work on how to manage my energy. So now 15 years on the other side of that burnout, I, I feel great. Like most days, you know, last night I was up till midnight. So I'm a little bit tired today. We had a big dinner party. It was great. It was fantastic. But like, I, it's a totally different life and I'm leading so much more like size and volume and complexity than I was when I burned out. 
And so ironically, I'm working less, I'm accomplishing more. It's mm. just this amazing thing. And back then I was working more and accomplishing less, even though the church was growing. Fascinating. And I think it's, um, it was funny because we were, as I mentioned, we were together last yeah, week and had a great breakfast you, in Dallas. You had margin. You had, you're like, you email me, Hey, you want to do dinner? And I'm like, I can't really do dinner. Uh, and you said, what about, what about breakfast? And, and it wasn't that, I mean, I work with a lot of different people and it's like, they don't just casually have margin to, I mean, it was gracious for you to reach out. I was happy to do it, but even there, we just kind of, we visited, there wasn't a rush to something else. You were in many ways, you know, showing what that looked like. And I, I thought it was kind of neat because, again, the, the book we're talking about is At Your Best, How to Get the Time, Energy, and Priorities Working in Your Favor. I could say, see, you were investing relational time even with you and me. It's mm. just, it was obvious that this was a passion that you had and you had space and place in your life for that. So it's fascinating to me because I think a lot of people get into what you call the stress spiral and... Yeah. Uh, mental and what so what mental shifts do we need in order to be healthier, more productive, and again avoid what you call the stress spiral? Define that and then talk to us. What what shifts do we need to avoid that? I tried to name uh, the condition that I find myself in if I'm not careful, and most of the people I know, respect, and love find themselves in. And the stress spiral is when you find yourself overwhelmed, overworked, and overcommitted. And most people, whether you have one job, you're bivocational, whether you're a stay-at-home parent, we would just say, because of the state of the world today, we're overwhelmed, overworked, overcommitted. And I tried to figure out, okay, well, why is that? And looking at my life and then the patterns of other leaders that I've had the privilege of interacting with, there's really three principal assets that we get dealt with every day that we have to manage. And this is just true of being human. And it's definitely true of being a leader. It's like you get time energy and priority. So every day you get 24 hours in a day, you have energy levels that wax and wane over the course of the day. And then you have priorities, things you want to accomplish. When you're in the stress spiral, uh, your time is not focused. It happens randomly. You just really just let things happen to you. You don't decide when they're going to happen. Your energy level is something you're kind of oblivious to other than feeling exhausted most of the time. And then your priorities continually get hijacked by other people. So that's the stress spiral. It reminds me of like a really crucial point that we're in right now because millennials are entering into their 40s. And that yeah. you feel old. Well, it, well right it, it's a, you, you both have the wisdom and the maturity <laughs> to answer this question. Then, where I'm a Gen Xer, so <laughs> I, you know, I think I think Carrie Gen Xer. I, no, uh, I'm a Gen Xer barely. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, same I with think, me. Same I think we're right on the year end. apart from each other. You and okay, I. Okay, there you go. I mean, okay, so you, you'll both have like excellent wisdom on this. Yes, it has excellent wisdom is your way of saying. We're older, <laughs> so, but good. But you know, Bob Beale talks about like decade by decade yeah. and some things are predictable. So in your forties, and that's kind of where you excel or you're, you're working hard at something. My guess is that that's, those are, that's the decade where you, you might be more prone to uh, stress. And, and so help us think through that for, for millennials or those that are entering into their forties, how to be more aware of time, energy, and priorities, because th that's really where you, you, you build your careers. Uh, no, I feel, and I think that's, if I could even elaborate on that, because I do feel that I'm, I'm at the age now, you know, I'm a professor, you know, good institution. I can now invest in younger, younger leaders um, like you, younger than me. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if you're in your forties, you're feeling it. I mean, I was during my four, I was finished my doctoral degree at 36. I think I was writing a book, writing, I wrote books throughout my 40s. I'm in a different pace now, mm -hmm. and I'm comfortable with that. So good. So, so, so looking at that listener, most of our listeners are going to be younger. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What, 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 how do you set that at that time? No, it's a very uh, keen observation. And I think you're right. I just had lunch with a 43-year-old leader who's probably right on the verge of burnout. And he's been in senior leadership for three years. And he said, what advice do you have for me? as someone in his 40s. And I said, go deep, go deep, go deep. The, the patterns you have, like in your 20s, you're figuring it all out, you're exiting school, you're trying to find a job, you're settling down in life. In your 30s, it's kind of your ramp up decade. And the 40s can be very turbulent. Your 40s, I think it's easy to grow cynical, it's easy to grow restless. And uh, the best advice being 56 myself, when I turned 50, I had great advice from a guy named Lane Jones. Lane works at North Point. 
Lane, who's a few years older than me, said, Carrie, your 50s are going to be spectacular. I'm like, Lane, you can't say that. I know him well enough to push back. I said, you can't say that because you're not a prophet. Like, you have no idea whether my 50s, they could be a train wreck. And he said, no. He said, I'm older than you are. And I've seen a lot of people move into their 50s. He said, you did all the hard work, the soul work, the emotional work, the messy work in your 30s and 40s. In your 50s, you'll reap the benefits of it. Now, slightly over halfway through my 50s, I think he's right. The 50s have been a lot easier for me than the 40s have been. And in the 40s, I was chasing down my demons. I was looking at the shadow side of my leadership. I was staring into my character. I was trying to figure out the patterns that I'm now talking to you about. I was trying to get off of the treadmill and onto a sustainable pace. I was trying to figure out by the time I was 42, 43, oh my gosh, I burned out at 41. How do I make sure this never happens again? And so I think continue to do the soul work, continue to do the really difficult work. And what, what scared me in that moment, I remember going to a lot of counseling around that time, and I would highly recommend therapy. But I think what was terrifying is we, we had a good run through my 30s. Yes, I was imploding internally, but the church was doing great, you know, right? Now, I think there's some bad theology mixed in with that observation, because I think if you're winning at work and losing at home, you're losing. But at the time, I didn't know that. But I was scared that if I went in and did the soul work that perhaps God was calling me to do, that God would take away the magic potion that was making everything grow. Wow. That wow. God would say, I'm, I'm going to remove the part of your personality that makes you successful. And I like to be successful. So Dude, I, I just want to interrupt. I totally feel that. Totally. I mean, that resonates with my experience as well. Really? What the yeah. fear of losing? Yeah, the fear the that if I, if I deal with the soul stuff, that the magic sauce is gone. In other words, the yeah. something related to this drivenness. I mean, gosh, you know, I get, I get, you know, I get two masters, two doctorates, written 12 <laughs> books, all by the time I was 50. So totally, but I'm just resonating with you, but keep going. No, and you know, Ed, when you really say that out loud, it seems absurd, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. And, and wouldn't the enemy love for us, if there really is an enemy, and I believe there's an enemy, wouldn't he love for you to believe that? that the, and and what, I, what I said to one of the leaders at lunch today was go as deep as God wants you to go. Because what I've realized on the other side is that he wasn't taking my drive away. He was redeeming it. Oh, that's good. He was shaping it. He was sanctifying it, to use an old world, word. And, you know, I thought I was leading a lot at the time. I'm leading 10x what I led back then. Yeah. And God kind of knew, you don't have the character for that. Yeah. You don't, you haven't figured out the pacing for that. So just let me go in there, do some open heart surgery, rip you apart and rebuild you so that perhaps you'll do better in your forties and in your fifties. And, you know, that's still just being transparent an area in my life. If I feel God knocking on my door going, Hey, let's take a look at that. I'm like, no, things are going pretty well right now. I think I'm pretty happy. And I don't know that, you know, I have to get better at trusting God that he can be trusted with my soul. Obviously it sounds so stupid when you say it out loud, but he can be trusted with my soul and with my heart. And if there's more work he needs to be done, then I should just surrender to that. And give him the consequences. So here's who I'm struggling personally right now. If we can just bleed all yeah. over you on another, um, I've got, you know, I've got, I got Carrie Newhouse, you know, it's like, he's coaching me. Like we're calling this a podcast, but it's Carrie's coaching. <laughs> that's, that's her. Uh, the thing I, I, I had, um, I had recently a conversation. We have my, you know, I have a trustee board and I love my trustees and I love that we're accountable to our trustees. That's another story for another day, but I love that one of them, his name's Greg Waybright, formerly the president of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Um, Lake Avenue Church, and now serving here with help as interim chaplain. So, but at the time he was on the board, and he says to me, "Ed, I'm concerned about the pace you're keeping; that it is too much, um, and you're going to burn out." And I and I said to him, and this was two two years ago. I said to him, uh, "This is pre-COVID in the before time." Now I would give a different answer in COVID because COVID about whipped me. Hmm. Um, but what I said to him was. So, Craig, I'm actually, there have been times when I really did run too much, too hard for too long. 
but I've kind of gotten a pace that is, I think, unusual to most people and a productivity that's unusual to most people. But I feel like it's sort of, I, Wayne Cordero once said, you know, everyone's got to fill their plate, and but some people have a bigger plate. Yeah. And, and I felt comfortable, and I, and I, I still do. In other words, I, I, I don't think my answer was incorrect. But I, so what I said was, so I think what feels like a very rapid pace to you is I've got a team, and I've got over 200 fuller part-time team members that eventually report up to and through me. Um, most of the things I do, someone else is doing, with, and I'm just there as a figurehead and more. So how do we know when we're just kind of, I mean, I felt like I'm hitting my stride. I feel good at the pace. I mean, again, uh, COVID, mm. we don't, it's not my interview where I tell you how COVID beat me. Um, mm. You know, just not, not the sickness. Uh, I haven't got COVID, but just, we became, I became overwhelmed in that. But I was at a good place before COVID knocked that out from under. So how do we know what's too much and not too much? Because I, I don't, I don't want to lack self-awareness. And Greg is a wonderful, I mean, he's been a key leader and touched thousands upon thousands of people's lives. He, he received my answer and we talked a little bit about it. He said, no, it sounds like you're at that place, but how do I know I'm not fooling myself? That is a great question. The fact that you are asking, how do I know I'm not fooling myself is a really Good sign, Ed. I'll answer that in two different ways. One is, how do the people closest to you think you're doing? How would Donna say you're doing? Yeah. How about your kids? Good. What about, you know, the people who see you on your good days or bad days, your assistant? Because you're right. Sometimes we lose perspective. And so I regularly ask the people around me, how do you think I'm doing? But then for my internal assessment, and I, I think this is transportable, I would look at five categories and the term I would use to evaluate those five categories would be margin. Um, how much margin do you have? So our breakfast last week in Dallas, case in point, I wanted, I did have the time and I wanted to make sure that when we got together, we were fully present. Like I wasn't yeah. on my phone. I wasn't not paying attention. I wasn't half listening. It's like, I wasn't going like, hang on, Ed, just a second, just a second. I got to take this call. I got to take this call. Okay. I'm back. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This just came in. Right. Like, I don't want to be that guy. So, yeah. you know, margin means you have a surplus margin means there's extra. So five categories for margin spiritual. Do you, do you feel like you're running a deficit with God? Do you feel like you have, have you ruthlessly eliminated hurry? Thank you, John Mark Comer and John Orper, Dallas Willard yeah. for that. Oh yeah. Do you have unhurried time with God? What about relationally? Do you have time for long dinners, like three, four, five hour dinners with friends, for date nights with your spouse, for friends, or are you like, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it? Um, emotionally, do you have emotional margin? Are you flying off the handle? Are you stressed out on a regular basis? Are your emotions working properly? Do you have emotional margin? Physical, how's your physical health? Um, you know, I had, uh, I, it's funny, I, uh, I broke my hand earlier this year and uh, then I crashed my bike. It's like, that was a good year for <laughs> athletics for me. But it took out two months from my ability to exercise. And I really miss it like that has been very good for me. And I, all through my thirties, I'm like, I don't have the time for that. Well, in the last 15 years, I've made time for that. And then financial. And, you know, most of us didn't get into ministry for the money. And if you did, that was a really stupid career move. But, <laughs> um, you know, you know, people who make $300,000 a year and they have debt up to their eyeballs. And then there are other people who make $30,000 a year and they have money in the bank. It's just a question of having extra to the point where you are generous, to the point where you're not nervous every time something breaks in your car. So those five categories, spiritual, emotional, relational, physical, and financial, do you have margin? If I'm five for five, I'm great. And I want to live the rest of my days five for five. And ironically, mm -hmm. often if you have margin in those departments, you will accomplish much more. And I completely agree that people have different size plates. And I'm amazed at what you do. Every time we connect, Ed, I'm like, how does he get it done? And now, you know what people are saying to me? I've noticed that, especially this year, because they'll often ask me, I'm a pretty prolific writer and, you know, books and articles and, you know, podcasts and that kind of thing. It's like, how do you produce that much content? But then the other question sometimes from the same person will be, and how do you seem to have so much time off? You're always relaxed in your backyard. You're already always hosting people. You're always on a bike ride or you're out on your boat. It's like the two are actually connected. Hmm. They're connected. I love it. Hey, Carrie, I, I've always been uh, curious about two things about you. Uh, one is how do you 
how do you say no to things? Um, <laughs> and how do you do it in a way where you're not mean or a jerk? And then secondly, is just how do you calendar? Because I think that would be really interesting and helpful to our, the leaders that are listening in. That's probably the hardest thing for me, uh, Daniel, is just to say no on a regular basis, because I would like to say yes to everything. And so what I've done is we've de developed a really good template for saying no. The joke with our staff is I paid a couple of our staff just to say no all day long. We, we are really blessed, have tremendous opportunities. We don't know how long they'll be here, but I never want to take them for granted. But like many people listening to a leadership podcast, I have more speaking opportunities than I can take advantage of. More people want to be on my show than I have space to have them on my show, et cetera, et cetera. So usually what it is, if you can say this truthfully, is you need to, I'll, I'll show you the how, and then I'll give you the framework. The how is you thank them, man, thank you for so much for inviting me. Thanks for expressing an interest. Thank you for being willing to, uh, and then be really firm and clear. Like, unfortunately, given my other commitments, I'm not able to do it. But I really thank you and thanks for the difference you're making. Sincerely, Carrie. Now, my staff will do that a lot better than me. Um, if you really want to get me in a weak moment, uh, stop me at a conference in the hallway and say, hey, can you? Because then I'm likely to cave. But then my staff will have to backtrack and say, sorry, you can't. Um, and then the other thing I would say is you should have a filter for what you say yes and what you say right. no to. That life is a series of repeating patterns. And if they don't repeat, at least they rhyme. And uh, I know that I would rather do a leadership podcast than a podcast. I know that there are certain audiences I would rather speak to. So there's a filter right there. There is, to a certain extent, just by the volume of requests we get, there's a certain number of downloads we look for in a podcast. And there's an intake form that answers all of that. Now, will I break out of that mold and sometimes do a really tiny show? Of course I will. Yeah. Uh, I really want to help somebody. I've got extra time. I will do that. Um, same with speaking engagements. Um, I don't do any guest preaching. That's a personal thing. But uh, I would rather speak to 100 leaders than 1,000 people. That's just me. So I have criteria like that. Yours might be different and will be sure. different. And then um, with the calendar, the other thing I do is I moved to a fixed calendar a number of years ago. I call it the Thrive Calendar. And in the calendar, I because life is a series of repeated patterns, I basically have the same week all the time unless I'm on the road. So my green zone, the time when I'm at my best is in the morning. Generally, nothing goes on my calendar before 11 a.m. And if it does, it's with my specific permission because in the morning I'm writing. And then in the afternoon, I do leadership podcast interviews where I am doing the interview or I'm a guest like I, you know, you graciously invited me to be on your show. So I'm doing this. I have another podcast interview right after that. And I do a little bit of admin in the afternoons. But I also know that um, I have a capacity. So often my weeks get filled up months in advance. I've already got my speaking calendar for 2022 planned out, and we set a threshold of no more than two speaking engagements a month. So I know I've had numerous people text me, email me in the last month. Hey, Carrie, I've got this thing in January of 2022. Can you do it? And my answer is no, because I'm already full. I already know that. Uh, now, if you look at my calendar, there's vast swatches of free time in my calendar still. So could I do some more events? Yes, I could. But I know if I do more than two events, but I also still want to write and I want to podcast and I want to produce and I want to have a little bit of time in my calendar so again, I can have breakfast with Ed or a date night with my wife or a bike ride around the lake. If I fill it up more than that, I'm full. So that's the idea of pre-scheduling your time so that you can set this calendar up so it works on your own rhythms. But now my team knows, yeah, you've got bandwidth in March or no, you don't. And they know that months in advance. So, so the, in, again, in the book, the just reminder when the title of the book is at your best, how to get the time, energy, and priorities working in your favor, uh, how to get time, energy, and priorities working in your favor. Um, you actually say having free time in your calendar is a trap. <laughs> Why is that? Why is that a trap? Yeah. So mo if you look at most people's calendars, in fact, if you're listening right now and can do it safely, pull out your phone, look at your paper calendar, whatever you use, and turn to four months from now, 90% of leaders will have nothing in their calendar 
for four months from now. It just looks like blank space. And so you think, okay, my life's a train wreck right now, but by the time I get to April, it's going to be fantastic. And I, you I get feel, to I April. I feel attacked. I feel attacked right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you get to April and you're like, it's a disaster again. So what happened? Blank space in your calendar is a trap. It looks like freedom, but it's jail disguised as liberty. Because what happens, and this gets into hijacked priorities, by the time you got to April, let's say you couldn't do something in December or January. So now you're like, okay, I'll do it in the spring. Well, the spring looked empty, but now it's super busy. And you've got all your usual stuff happening. And then you said yes too many times to things. So that's why if you look at, let's pick a date, March, 2024 in my calendar, I already have it planned. I can tell you what I'm doing on Monday. I'm writing content in the morning. What am I doing Monday afternoon? I'm podcasting. How about Tuesday? Tuesday morning, I'm free. If it's an ideal week, I haven't got any meetings on Tuesday. Wednesday morning, uh, I'm free to do some writing. Wednesday afternoon, I have two podcast interviews in March of 2024. Why? Because I always do podcasting Wednesday afternoons. And it's amazing. If you work in advance... Even some of the top leaders in the world usually are available Wednesday at one or Wednesday at three Eastern. And once in a while you have to pivot, once in a while you have to flex, but often you don't. I know what I'm doing Thursday and Friday will be a free day. Why? Because I never book anything on Friday. And so what that allows me to do, now I make exceptions to that, but they're exceptions. That way I've decided, and we know that I do about 15 commitments a week, that's it. That includes an interview like this, one-on-ones with my team. Anything that is me not working on content, the max is about 15. If we exceed it, we exceed it on purpose. That's my number. I know that I thrive when it's 12 to 15 commitments a week. Below 12, I get bored. Over 15, I start to get overwhelmed. So maybe that's a lower capacity than some people, but it works fine for me. And then we also know that I need to be home most of the time and on the road two or three times a month at the most, and that's it. And so that's how we tweak those formulas. And in the book, I'll show you how to tweak the formula for your life. But, um, you know, that's worked out really well. And if it stops working for me, guess what? We'll tweak the formula. Maybe I can only handle 12 months or 12 meetings, or maybe I need 20. Maybe I'm in a season where I'm all of a sudden prolific. Well, we can switch the calendar accordingly. And what that does is because you're getting inbound every single day and you think, well, today's really busy, but April will be open. So you put it in April, you jam April, you forgot about all of your regular commitments that you have in April. And now April comes and it's a nightmare. I think this has been really practical for our listeners. And again, most of them are pastors and ministry leaders. As we get ready to wrap up here, uh, what would you say is what's what's one of the big takeaways that you want pastors and ministry leaders in particular to take away from this conversation? So what kills this, Daniel, is, and you know this as a pastor, both of you have pastored churches, is so much of what threatens to overtake your life as a pastor comes with the label of an emergency. So it's Saturday morning, you're home with your kids, you're having a lazy pancake breakfast, having the best day off, you don't have to preach on Sunday, and your phone rings, and it's someone at the church, and their marriage is in flames, and they need to see you now, Ed, they need to talk to you now, Daniel, come on, can you meet with me, my family's in crisis? Well, first of all, that presents as an emergency, but if you really think about it, it's not an emergency, it's not like they woke up at 6 a.m. and had a great marriage, and suddenly by 8 a.m. it's going you know, down in flames, their their marriage has been bad for a long time. They chose on a Saturday morning to explain that to you. Now, every Mm -hmm. once in a while, you're going to have a legit emergency. If there's a car accident and a two-year-old is in critical care in the hospital, yeah, you should probably drop what you're doing. But that doesn't happen every Saturday. But people who have personal crises and marriage crises and financial crises, that happens on a regular basis. So what you should do is say to them, first of all, I wouldn't give out your number very, or have a burner phone or something like that. So you can at least have a life, right? I would do that. But if they have your number, if everyone has your number, you say, I am so sorry for your marriage. Thank you for reaching out to me. Unfortunately, I'm not available today. Can we meet tomorrow? Maybe after church, or can we meet Tuesday afternoon? You know, if you have a meeting slot and you have three counseling slots or three meeting coffee slots in the week, give them one of those and just say, hey, can I meet with you Tuesday at two o'clock? Most reasonable people will say yes. And you hang up the phone, you go back and you play with your family, maybe after praying for them. But I know so many families that have suffered because 
the pastor can't say no. It's like, well, I got to go out. And then there's always another thing. And then you got that wedding and the wedding took up Friday night and it took up all of Saturday and Saturday night. Now you're running into Sunday tired. And so I think better boundaries. And when you train a church not to be dependent on you entirely and learning to be independent or interdependent and dependent on God, that's what allows you to reach more people. When I was the guy who was always on standby, our church was small. And then when it became a bigger church, you know, people were cared for, but I wasn't doing all the caring, which ironically allows me to care for more people. You see Mm. how that works? It's fascinating. That's a good word. You've been listening to Kerry Newhoff. Be sure to check out his new book, At Your Best, How to Get Time, Energy, and Priorities Working in Your Favor. You know, you can also learn more about Kerry at KerryNewhoff.com. You have to spell that. I mean, how do you, how, who Kerry knows Newhoff. how to spell Newhoff? Yeah, who come N-I-E-U. up with a name like that? Exactly. Stetzer. W-H-O-F. There you go. Wow. Dot com. I guess if you, just, if, you Google, if you Google any variation of that, it's like Vanderblumen's name. It just right. shows up. It just shows Yeah, up. William right. and I did that on purpose. We got really yeah. weird names so that we could own the internet. <laughs> yeah, Leith, Leith, Leith Anderson once told me that when you have a weird name, you'll appreciate it one day because people are easy. It's easier to find you. They can remember. So there you go. Leith. Yeah. You know, true. I don't even know what Leith is. Yeah, I was Sorry, not a fan of the name when I was a kid. No, uh-huh. it's awesome now. And to our listeners, thanks again for listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com. If you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. You can find this podcast as well as other great Christian podcasts on the Faith Play app, available for both Apple and Android. We'll see you on the next episode. You've been listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast. For more great interviews, as well as articles, videos, and free resources, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.